Um, we've got, um, the reason we've put on a session here today is primarily we've got a group of design students who are working on some Oxfam projects for us, um, which we're very excited to have. And we thought that it would be really great to try to actually um, give the sense of the context within which we work. In 2000, world leaders came together and put together the Millennium Development Goals. Um, it's a very big, if you ask me, a very big, big, big technical subject. But with our action partners, uh, what we've been able to learn from them is that they are very small initiatives that people can do in their communities that help their governments build towards the achievement of these Millennium Development Goals. And today, in particular, I'm going to talk about the sixth goal, which is to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And within this goal, there were three targets that were set in achieving it. And the first one is that by 2015, we will have halted and begun to reverse the spread of HIV and AIDS. The second one is that by 2010, which is this year, that universal access to treatment for HIV AIDS uh, will be available to those that need it. And the third target set against this goal was that by 2015, um, we'll have halted and begun to reverse the incidence of malaria and other diseases like tuberculosis. Uh, the general picture, as the United Nations have reported, is that the spread of HIV AIDS has stabilized and in some cases is even beginning to reduce. And many young people around the world, especially in developing countries, still lack the knowledge to protect themselves against like, HIV AIDS. It's just not customary. People will not talk about sex in public. So people will not know, will not even discuss HIV AIDS. Now, this is my experience from Zambia. We have seen in the last few years an increase in women's organizations. So what these women's organizations did was they would target those communities to talk to the women, you know, so that they're able to negotiate safe sex with their husbands. And of course, culture steps in where people will tell you, well, a woman's place is not to negotiate such things. But through the years, we've seen women becoming more and more empowered to negotiate safe sex. In cases where their children left parentless because of HIV AIDS, stigma and discrimination in small communities comes with those children. Their education about the disease is very limited. They know that that house has the plague. So these organizations would talk to women, talk to communities, just increasing um, awareness of what AIDS really is, how to prevent AIDS, how to live with people that are infected, and how to support those that are affected by the disease. The infection of the, dis the disease continues to be much faster than the rate at which people have access to antiretroviral drugs. In Zambia, for instance, the drugs are available. They'll tell you on TV, we'll have the politicians screaming it out, we have antiretrovirals. People get to the hospitals and there's nothing there. Um, out of a global study by the UN, of the people that were infected uh, by HIV AIDS, 40% of them were young people, and by young, I'm talking 14, 15 to 25. So this is you know, the most productive age in society, and we are losing more and more young people. But at the same time, we have other people that are taking the smallest steps to educate young people. So there is hope that the disease may at least take less people. I'm going to share a little bit about the impact of climate change in Tuvalu. As temperature increase, sea level, sea level then rise by water expanding from heat. And the highest point of Tuvalu is only less than four meters above sea level. King tides are abnormal high tides. This is usually happens between February and March every year. However, in the three years, the high tides have risen to a considerable higher than normal. The king tide in 2006 lasted only for a few hours, but it leaves behind a trail of unforgettable disaster. Tuvalu is a coral low-lying low atoll and geologically young. The soil is poorly developed and infertile. So erosion and deposition of soils on coastal areas are natural processes that occur over long periods of time, but sometimes very rapidly. 
The processes of erosion become more intensive when combined with extreme storm events and rising sea levels. For storm surge, there is increasing number of storm surges on Funafuti in the last few years. Funafuti is the main island. And storm surge is an offshore rise of water associated with low pressure weather systems. The southern part of the local Funafuti, the main island, has been hit by three strong searches in the last five years. The locals who experienced this search were terrified, and some still speak of the dreadful experience. The porous soils of Tuvalu have limited fertility and support a narrow range of food plants. It is a national challenge to increase the fertility of the soil to enhance subsistence agriculture in order to increase household income through selling of gardening produce. So agricultural crops like bulaka and taro are planted in peat and rely heavily on groundwater. Unfortunately, with rising sea level, inundation of groundwater by seawater has caused these traditional crops to die out. Um, we also use, what do you call it, seawall? We are using seawall to, um, to counter the um, the um, impact of um, sea level rise coming into the land. But as the sea level rises, the, 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 the sea wall has to be uh, renewed and to be um, uh, raised to. This is on one of the outer islands, part of the um, land. All the coconuts, and because we live on pulaka, fish and coconuts, that's our main diet. And coconuts does not only provide um, food, but also provide drinks. And also it helps for, the, um, for building houses. We have to, um, we have to prove to the um, international community like what we have been campaigning for to have concern on small islands like us to reduce the um, gas emission. We have to use solar energy. <clears throat> they think although um, Tuvalu's contribution in terms of um, trying to set up the, trying to use solar energy as, for electricity is um, insignificant um, in relation to the um, global level. But at least they have to show to the global in, um, community that we are ready to commit. And please, because we don't want to go somewhere. We don't want to lose our land. The, the average surface temperature of the Earth has risen by 0.8 degrees Celsius since the late 1880s. Scientific evidence implies that greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are the main cause. The science shows that unless greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, temperatures will further increase over the coming century. The Earth's ecosystem is extremely sensitive to changes of even a few decimals of degrees as we are already witnessing. A warming of seven degrees would have devastating impacts upon the world, but even two degrees would lead to a significantly different world from the one we now inhabit. <coughs> Climate change is a major development challenge and risks undoing all the progress organizations like Oxfam have made towards ending global poverty. Oxfam's experience in nearly 100 countries shows that hundreds of millions of people are already suffering from a rapidly changing climate, and this is frustrating their efforts to escape poverty. The latest natural disaster that Oxfam is currently responding to is the flooding in Pakistan, which has affected at least 20 million people, the population of Australia. Although no individual disaster can be directly attributed to climate change, the flooding in Pakistan is broadly consistent with predicted climate change impacts for that region. The situation in Pakistan also exemplifies the bitter irony of climate change, that countries that will be hardest hit by the effects of climate change, developing countries, have contributed only a fraction to causing it. So with that in mind, let's look at the economics of climate change, and firstly, the very issues of action versus inaction. The first major study on this issue was the Stone Review in 2006, updated 2009. Its main message is that the economic cost of inaction or delayed action on climate change far outweighs the cost of action now. The main points to emphasize from all these reports and 
lots of other ones, are that one, we can afford it now if we act now. The cost of climate action to the Australian economy is reasonably small and easily absorbed. Two, failing to act and lagging behind others will have significant economic as well as environmental costs. And three, Australia is already losing out on opportunities for innovation, jobs, growth and investment because we do not have a strong climate change policy. Countries like Australia have become wealthy and have been able to develop because they have emitted large amounts of greenhouse gases in the process of industrialization. They should bear the responsibility of reducing emissions on a large scale and provide financial and technical support to, ve to developing countries to enable them to achieve sustainable development. We need to get past the concept that material wealth equals quality of life and actually realize that sustainable sustainable planet is the only way in which we can guarantee the continuation of good, if not better, standards of living 